Welcome to Municipal Affairs, where today we are marking the end of an era, particularly for Alberta's rural municipalities. After four years of dedicated leadership, Paul McLaughlin will be stepping down next week as president of the rural municipalities of Alberta. His tenure has been one of both challenges and transformation, with Alberta's rural areas navigating complex issues from economic shifts, infrastructure needs, to evolving relationships with the provincial government. Paul's leadership has helped shape RMA's path forward, advocating for rural concerns and positioning Alberta's rural municipalities as vital players in the province's future. In this special episode, we chat with Paul to reflect on his time in office and the pivotal moments that have defined his presidency. We'll also discuss his views on how RMA has evolved over the past four years and the future he envisions for the organization and Alberta's rural municipalities. Now, with five candidates vying to fill his shoes, Paul also shares his advice for the incoming president. So stay with us as we explore Paul's legacy and look ahead to the future of rural governance in the province of Alberta. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Paul, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me for what will probably be the last time you and I will be speaking as you are the outgoing uh, president of RMA as of November 6th. Looking back on the last four years in office as your time as president comes to an end, how is it feeling right now? You know, it's funny. I, I, I wish I was uh, inherently lazy that I would just not do anything on the way out the door. That's not what I'm doing, Chris. Uh, I kind of have some working work balance issues. So right down the wire, I will be working until I no longer am president. Um, a lot of people have asked me, they said, how does it happen? Uh, how it usually works is uh, first you're president and then you're not. Uh, it's that quick. So, uh, but uh, no, you know what? It's, it's exciting. I think that... Um, it's amazing to work with such an amazing group of people, both the, from the staff size and our management team and then the board. And, and uh, it's one of those things. Am I nervous about it? I think, I think it's, uh, it's going to be pretty amazing. I think it'll be a neat change. It'll be a, it's a great organization and, and it's one of the best jobs you can have as a politician in the province of Alberta. So I stick to that. You, four years ago in 2020, you were elected by the members to represent the organization. And in the last four years, municipalities have gone through a gambit of changes and gambit of challenges. For you, what's been the most sort of rewarding part of the job working with the different municipalities across the province of Alberta? Yeah, you know, I think the best thing is we all have a story to tell. And I think that uh, the pride and you get the advantage, you get to hear the pride that people have in their communities. Uh, I, I think I've been in uh, 69 places that call themselves God's country. Um, and and I think that uh, recognizing that that uh, all that pride manifests itself in people providing community service, um, all the different views. Uh, I love their stories, their personal stories, what motivates people. I think it's pretty neat. There's a lot of energy out there. Um, and I think that uh, the fact is that RMA can kind of har harness that. Probably the best part of the job, too, is the camaraderie between us and each other. Uh, we're kind of our own little support group, our own little mentoring group. And and uh, the fact is we both we all understand what each other's up against and, and we kind of tie together and help each other. Uh, it's a pretty neat organization to be part of that way. And and uh, it's pretty exciting and always looking forward to the conference, too. It's always lots of fun. Before we talk about the conference, I want to stick on you for a few more minutes. But is there anything you wish you would have been able to get done? I know you're still working and you're going to be working up until that election and that result is announced of who's going to be your successor. But is there something you wish you were able to get done in your time? 
Well, I think that, you know, the runway is never long enough. Uh, we do have a, a fixed election. So we have, you can only run for three consecutive terms. Uh, could I have got more done in another term undeniably? Uh, but I think that, you know, uh, my goal was to, to elevate uh, rural municipalities and, and our story to be part of the dialogue, uh, to, to share in the, the uh, building of communities in the province. I think I've achieved that. Um, you know, have I got everything done? I haven't. Um, Taxes still aren't being paid. Uh, there's going to be a provincial police force, uh, a bunch of other stuff. But are they? Is there any decisions that we had made that we haven't made? And I think that every time that um, rural municipalities had a choice to have a voice, uh, even though the voice could be in support of or against different decisions by others, I think we've had a pretty solid uh, database and solution-driven voice, and and I'm proud of that. And I think that uh, that's where the bar is at for the organization. And I've, I've got so much left to do, Chris. I'm, it's funny people call this retirement. I, I, I think that's not who I am. Um, and uh, I'm still the Reeve of Pinocchio County. Uh, I still run my, uh, my consulting co- company too and have been the whole time. So I, I don't, I'll never really retire, Chris, ever. You, you mentioned unpaid oil and gas property taxes. And I want to play in that sandbox for a little bit, if you don't mind, because you and I've talked about that on a reg- regular occurring basis, and it does not seem like it's going to be fixed by next Wednesday. And your predecessor will have to, your successor will have to address that as well. What should your successor be hammering the provincial government on that you wish you were went a little bit further on to get this fixed? Because I talked to your members and your members are concerned that this 300 million is going to be 500 million one day or even a billion dollars one day. Well, and I, and I think you're, you know, Chris, it's interesting because all I ever wanted was a, was the AR to say they would start using non unpaid taxes as a compliance order. And so I got a letter from uh, minister Jean to that effect. And then working with the AR, um, they communicate to us that the AR will never actually uh, uh, trigger an enforcement order to have a company going to bankruptcy. So I've got a letter from Minister Jean. What I I got everything I wanted, Chris, and I still didn't get what I wanted. And I think that uh, this this question, I think that this question needs to continue. The pressure needs to be put on uh, with an understanding that uh, it is the intention of, of uh, AR not to enforce this. So then I would put it back on cabinet. Um, I think that they, what the predecessor, whoever follows me, uh, needs to establish a strong relationship with the rural MLA and the rural MLA caucuses um, specifically and work with them. I think that we need to assist rural MLAs to continue to have that voice. This is a rural issue. It on, honestly is. Um, it, it is continuing. It's getting worse. Uh, my members have lost $60 million in the last t- nine weeks, 10 weeks. Um, gone, gone forever. And so uh, recognizing that that continues. And, and this is a big you know, this is a big existential crisis issue because if this isn't fixed, then what else can't get fixed? So um, we can have the situation in other sectors. Uh, at the same time, there's the environmental liability that's tied to, to these that need to be discussed. So there's a lot of moving pieces. And I think it really comes down to this is a proxy for our bigger discussion, which is we're stewards of the land and helping them making those land use decisions and choices. And we need to be part of it. Um, but we've been involved with this conversation lately and i think i I want to echo or at least people understand one of the key pieces is that surface leases are paid by oil and gas companies and they're about 2500 to 3300 bucks so that's paid to the farmers and in on this issue the government can realize that you know they they've managed to not make rural minnesota leaders happy and you can kind of get away with that in alberta but it's really hard if you make landowners mad and what's happening is, is the landowners aren't being paid their surface leases. These surface leases sounded like a lot of money. Um, given the current price of farmland, that is not a lot of money anymore. Three, three grand, get off my land and get out of here. If you're not paying, take your stuff and go. And that's a message that we've shared with the government. And I think they are quite, they have not quite heard that before from rural Alberta. And that's from a landowner perspective, not as Paul McLaughlin or even Pinocchio County, not as army president, but that's what I'm hearing from landowners is get out of here. If you can't pay your taxes and your surface leases, you should just leave, just go away, grab your stuff and go. So I, I, I had the pleasure of speaking to Premier Smith a few weeks ago, and I asked her this question about the zombie oil and gas companies. And she said she wants to get to the root cause of why they're not paying their uh, their uh, property taxes or their lease uh, agreements to their farmers. 
What do you have to say to that? Because it seems like she should have known about this issue because as I've said on the show and I've spoken to uh, many of the candidates running to replace you, if there's one thing I can uh, know that's going to happen every year is I have to pay my property taxes and RMA is going to send me a news release saying that the unpaid oil and gas property taxes has gone up this year. This is an issue she should know. And shouldn't they have gotten to the bottom of it by now? Oh yeah. Well, and, and yeah, the, the bottom of it is you can, you can run an oil and gas company in province of Alberta and not pay your surface leases or your property taxes. Uh, there's a company up in the North that's been running seven years, hasn't paid municipal taxes and hasn't been paid property taxes or property uh, payments. So seven years, seven years, they have 50 infractions by the AER right now. Um, still able to function. They owe my member a lot of money. Uh, they haven't been paying surface leases. You can run an oil and gas company in province of Alberta without paying your taxes. Uh, so that's that's the, the root cause of it is you can get away with it and really bad people do it. There's a bunch that won't do it. There's a bunch that definitely are good corporate citizens and do what they, they should do. And there's 95% of them that do it. And it's funny because I get I get sort of, I'm the guy that talks a lot about unpaid taxes for oil and gas. But th- again, this is the proxy discussion around recognizing that our municipal authority is eroded by another agency not actually fulfilling their duty of care um, for, for municipalities. So in other words, the AR under Directive 67 has, a resp- has the right to look at unpaid taxes and surface leases as a condition of operational and gas fill, and they decide not to do so. So when they decide not to do so, they fail their duty of care. And that's really the message that I have is that it's not only that, it's decisions made by the AUC as it relates to renewables on, on, prime, crown, on cr- prime farmland. It's just this recognition of our authority and not that we need to have all the power, but we should still maintain the influence on decision making. And that's really what this whole conversation is about. One of the other areas that you had to uh, deal with over the last four years is infrastructure funding. Now, I have spoken to members in the north and the south and the east and the west in this province, and they all tell me that bridges are being uh, dilapidated and they're getting put on the backs of them, the members themselves, that they have to go in and repair the bridges. Roads are being uh, not paved correctly because they just don't have enough money to fully pave the roads that are currently being held by municipalities. Do you think RMA and RMA members are being adequately supplied with the fundings that they need from the province to address the infrastructure deficits that they have? Yeah, I I think it's a, and this is probably the most powerful campaign that we've come out with recently. And and if you've had a chance to look at our infrastructure deficit reporting, so it is about bridges, roads, and, and we just came out with utilities. And, and what that story is, is we've been holding the line for a long time. But what's happened is, is that the government has taken about a billion dollars of the initial Stelmac province. And I'll call it the Stelmac province, where he recognized uh, the fact that there should be supports in the in the shape of MSI at the time, Municipal Sustainability Initiative, that that funding could allow us to deal deal with this. Everything from that to STIP to police funding model, um, that downloading, uh, to the erosion of those funds, and then ultimately the cost of life, as we all know. I just went grocery shopping day. It was very traumatic for me, Chris. It's very expensive. Don't and, tell me uh, that. I'm doing that right after this interview. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not going to be good. Um, but craft dinner is still uh, still reasonable. You can eat that. Um, and so so the, the reality is that we've had all this downloading. We've been hold, holding the line. Uh, and what we realized is that that now we're starting to slip backwards, Chris. And he, you know, I'm Pinocchio County and I know my finances really well. We've been doing an amazing job, but you know what? The other shoe's dropping. I can feel it right now. I can tell as a municipality, we're like, wait a minute. Um, between the $6.9 million of unpaid taxes, between the downloading of police funding model that's close to a million dollars, between the increases of ICF, the intermunicipal collaboration framework funding, all these pieces are starting to make it almost impossible for me to start fulfilling my infrastructure needs and exactly what you're hearing from our members is exactly what I'm feeling as Reba Pinal County. And that's what I'm hearing as president of RMA. We are starting to slip backwards. Um, the promise that was made by Stelmac should be honored by this government, recognizing that we do have tax room that's mo- that's being used up by school tax. And as such, that tax room that's being used up was supposed to be replaced by MSI, which is now LGFF. It's a shell of its former self. The, uh, the ability of municipalities to pay their bills and, the, and then maintain infrastructure will be definitely threatened within the next five to 10 years. You'll see the dissolution of rural municipalities. That has not happened since the 30s. If this government does not make funding changes, you will see bankrupt municipalities in the next five to 10 years, guaranteed. 
that's a big claim. And I'm not trying to hold your feet to the fire here, but what evidence do you have to back that up? Because we, we everyone says the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and then it doesn't fall. So what evidence do you have to back that up? Because I can imagine someone listening to this in Edmonton right now saying, oh, that's just Paul being Paul, and he's just trying to scare us to giving him more money. That's right. So a uh, municipality, gross revenue of $6 million, just lost $5.6 million of unpaid taxes from one oil and gas company that's in the north. Uh, many of the companies that are in the, horse, the horseshoe formation. So again, relying quite a bit on oil and gas. Uh, they've had unpaid taxes and they've had degradation of tax, tax taxes uh, from, from shallow gas. So the shallow gas reduction. So many of those municipalities in the eastern part of the province is being threatened. Those that don't have renewables, uh, definitely you can use that. You can just start looking at our basic finance where we start looking at the situation where there's downloading of funds, uh, the decrease of funds. And really all you have to do is look, do a straight line calculation of any municipality, what their gross revenue is and what the uh, what the LGFF is right now. And you can actually reverse engineer that and realize that that ratio is so low now for some municipalities that their ability to meet their current, their future infrastructure needs other than a new form of taxation uh, will not, well, they just won't be able to meet it. It's not possible. At the same time, the government is looking at decreasing and or providing other subsidies to own gas industry, which would be on the backs of many of those municipalities. So undeniably, Many municipalities are on the ropes. One municipality is al- would almost be effectively bankrupt uh, by, by unpaid taxes uh, and the fact that they have no more reserves available. So you'll start seeing municipalities in distress. And, you know, the thing is, is that, uh, that I hate using shock and drama, but uh, I know these finances really well. I know what it's like to, to, to run a county like my own. I know I'm, we're, Pinoca County is in the dead middle. And if the dead middle is having a hard time, Everyone that's what's that's on the left to me is having a tough go, and everybody to the right to me is having a tough go too. And once you know that's the situation, undeniably, as I said, between five and eight municipalities will definitely be uh, in the state of, of of disrepair and bankruptcy in the next five to ten years. So earlier on in the interview, you said that you, when you became president, you wanted to put rural matters on the map, and you wanted to have a more collaborative approach with the province. Looking at the challenges that lay ahead for rural municipalities, do you think you were able to accomplish that and get rural issues in forefront at Premier uh, Daniel Smith or even Premier Jason Kenney's uh, feet? Or do you think there's still more work to be done? No, I think, I think, you know, we started the relationship. They know we're here. I mean, we're easy to take for granted. Um, you know, my running joke is that uh, rural Alberta votes blue. And even if they, that's the stark reality. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we do get taken for granted a little bit. Um, you know, it's interesting when I talk to people, they're like, oh, I thought rural municipalities got everything they wanted. Uh, that's not the case. Um, but, you know, we're, we're respected. We respect government. We work well. And, you know, we're, we're interesting because we're that friend, right? Like you've always got those friends that are going, yeah, you're awesome. And, and, you know, you're a really good singer. And then those are people that show up on the voice and they're not good singers. And you're like, what kind, who's got, what kind of friends do you have? You can't sing. Like have people have been telling you, you know how to sing. Um, and so, you know, we're, cause we're nonpartisan and because we need to be the voice of our members that we definitely will push back against things that we disagree with as an organization. Um, and, and, but at the same time, we collaborate on so many factors. We've been s- supportive of the government in many of the things dealing with drought. Uh, a lot of the discussions tied to some of the forestry discussions we're having up north now, dealing with the forest issues. Um, everything, everything that really that goes on outside government, we have every opportunity to engage with and been supportive of. So, yeah, I think we're building a collaborative framework. You know, is it as collaborative as it was in the early 2000s? It, it's it's a little different, um, but I think that we've got partisan politics at play right now, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of government's energies being spent dealing with party politics as opposed to constituency politics. That shift's occurred everywhere. Uh, the same, it's the same with MPs. It's the same in other jurisdictions. But the one thing I think without being too dramatic, Chris, is that the hyper-urbanization that's occurring right now is a very important thing. 200,000 people are moving to Alberta. Less than 5% are moving to rural Alberta specifically. So the majority of the people are moving to, to the big, bigger centers. That hyper-urbanization is definitely starting to dilute the, the voice of rural Alberta. And that's just a standard demographic change. It's occurring all over the world. Um, but rural Alberta needs the bigger voice now that they've ever had, because undeniably, you're going to have a situation in the next census that 10% rural, 90% urban. 
that's a pretty significant change from even when I was first elected. And, and that's occurring on the planet Earth everywhere. And that's going to change politics forever. If not, it already has. I just wanted to pick up on that for a second before I turn to the RMA organization as a whole. We are seeing more and more smaller urban villages and towns being, I don't want to say amalgamated, but being dissolved and put into uh, urban rural municipalities. We're seeing it firsthand right now play out in Clearwater County. The only reason I know that is because I, I speak to Michelle Swanson on a regular basis, but she, the village of Caroline is being dissolved into the Clearwater County. And we're seeing that happen over and over again. Can rural municipalities handle that uh, dissolving of smaller communities into their sort of budget when you're talking about the budget strains that you already have? Well, it's amazing, and uh, and I think that uh, you know definitely any of the have municipalities, the the yeah. ones with low population, high high uh, high revenue, um, it it tends to be less less jarring to them. Uh, but but uh, have not dis- dissolving into a a, a a struggling municipality, that's a tough transaction. These usually these come with. Uh, uh, very little uh, asset management, uh, very little care and attention to the sewer. Uh, you know, no village uh, mayor has been elected on on uh, the the. Uh, if I flush the toilet, it will be successful. They never use that on their posters, um, but that's really where the money needed to go. And I think that uh, by the time they get to that stage, Chris, they are in pretty rough shape. Uh, those those leaders in that community have done the best they can with with binder twine and duct tape, but it is a pretty rough place by the time. Our, my, so that being said, my members assume extreme liabilities, and and uh, the village of Wadman was probably one of the most significant I've seen next to next to um, uh, MDA Greenview's absorption of grand cash, but the uh, Wadman was a $24 million touch. That's not a big place if you've ever been to Wadman. And that was a Hail Mary, amazing what that last council did. They spent a lot of money going out the door. And so one of the things that we've been asking for on the dissolution file is actually to to have a, a transition fund, to spend more energy on asset management. The government is listening, and and I would say that uh, that Minister McIver has been pushing an asset management become a bigger discussion. I think it needs to become the way of small villages. And uh, and you know what? It's not sexy. Uh, flushing a toilet, it's hard to make it sound cool. But when it doesn't work, that's a very bad day, Chris. That's a real bad day. It's a crappy day, if you ask it's me. It's a crappy day, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to turn to the RMA as an organization because the, the organization has also gone through some very large growth in your time as president. Uh, I know this episode is going to be airing on Saturday, November 2nd. And on the 4th, you're having your brand new grand opening of your new RMA facility. Now, in the spring convention, you said this is the one thing you want to make sure you get done before uh, you leave your term a time as uh, uh, as president is to open that new facility. And it is opening it must be a little weight off your shoulders that all that hard work is now paying off. Well, and you know what, this is the, this is the beauty of working with amazing people. And, uh, uh, it, you know, I'm just a talent, Chris, uh, you should see the, uh, the, the brains behind the, the organization and, and everything from, uh, from our, our key crew and, uh, Dwayne Gladden, who's, who's running our ship. He's been phenomenal. And, uh, and, and Dave Dextrace, he's the one that's actually taken on the building and, and, uh, and, and made it become a reality. Uh, you know, what people don't know about us is that we actually have uh, one of the largest procurement organizations, nonprofit in Canada. I think it's one of the fourth largest. Uh, we have one of the oldest reciprocals. So we self-insure a uh, pretty significant book there. So, what really pays for the president, what pays for uh, the, the large advocacy team we have, uh, which is actually three times the size it was uh, even a year ago, um, is, is actually through our business services. So it's been amazing. Yeah, it's a great accomplishment. And it, it's, you know, it's, it's been really the team's work. And I'll be honest with you, I was kind of hoping they didn't finish it. And then I would just say, hey, I tried. It's really not my problem. I was going to leave it with the next president, but, but I think that uh, uh, I think at the at the last minute got it got it open. So it's a pretty amazing facility. So I hope people do take a chance uh, to pop in. We have an open house and definitely check it out. And we're proud of what we're doing. We've got some great people working with us, and uh, and we're doing some pretty amazing work on that side too as well. What does the future of RMA as an organization hold? Because you you must there's always metrics that someone puts into place when you become president or you become a head of an organization. So is there anything that you wish you were able to get done from the RMA organizational standpoint, or are you happy with where it is right now as you're leaving? 
You know, I, actually, it, it, I think I actually, I think me and the board really probably blew our KPIs out of the, of the water. Like we've tripled, we've tripled our advocacy team. So here's the thing. There's two ways to do advocacy. I can yell and scream and say, Paul's right. Or it, like you were calling me out. Okay, show me some data. Show me the truth. Yeah. So we've, we've been data driven. And you know what? Um, our advocacy team is exceptional. Like the, like they are, they are the brains of the outfit. The work they're doing is just top notch. And so we're actually leveraging this, Chris, to start actually doing direct advocacy federally. And, and this is to deal with, with direct Alberta issues. And we're actually starting to work with Saskatchewan, Manitoba on, on those issues that are unique to Western Canada and actually leveraging uh, the fact that we can collect this really good data uh, and actually present really good solutions to problems. So, uh, so I think that, you know, Really, what we've we've actually achieved, I think, as a board, is that is the fact that now we're really loaded up. We're queuing up our members to be successful with really good information, and and to really be driven by solutions and not just screaming and yelling and saying because, you know, just because it is. That's just the way it should be. And so um, I think that we're proud of that. Business wise, I think business growth is forty five, fifty five percent. No, probably about fifty five, fifty percent. Uh, business growth on both the insurance and on and on the uh, procurement side, which is incredible. So, um, you know what? We just we create good teams. We give people a place to be successful. I think it's important, and I think the organization is uh, is about as healthy as you could you could make it at this stage. So, uh, and that's because of the people. That's what we that's what we do, and that's who supports us, and that's how we get the job done for sure. Rural municipalities have had very strong leaderships in both Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta with yourself, Ray Orb, and Cam Blight, all leading their organizations. And now all three of you are gone all within a few months of each other. Uh, do you have faith that at a federal level, rural municipalities in Western Canada will be hurt? I, I do. And, you know, uh, Cam and, and Ray has had the same philosophy as I have. Um Really, I know their boards. I know their their vice presidents. They got they just amazing people, and and both of the, both of them and their leadership style have made tons of space for for succession, tons of space for success out elsewhere in the organization. So you know, I think you look at someone like me. I'm I'm the spokesperson for the organization, but my my board are is the organization and are the spokesperson for the organization. So really, you know what? If I won the lottery, RMA is going to be just as good as before. I even showed up and it's only, it's cause it's the people. And, yeah. and uh, that's been the philosophy that Al had before I came on. And, and that was a philosophy way back uh, when, when Bob Bars was there too as well. And, and that continues to the day. That's a philosophy of, of our organizations and all three municipal organizations had that same philosophy. So very team driven. So it's pretty neat. So I'm uh, I'm I'm gonna sit from the sidelines. I keep saying I'm gonna sit from the sidelines. I'm not a sidelines guy. I'll probably sit really close to the sidelines. I'll be the obnoxious cowbell parent um, as it goes forward. But but I think that uh, um, you know they're gonna do some amazing things, and and I and I I think that I'm there to help. But I think they'll do an amazing job going forward it for sure. Is your wife ready for you to be home more often than you have been in the past? Because your time on the board it meant you were all over the country and with FCM, with RMA. Now you can be home sitting with her from time, actually, at nights from some nights, I'm assuming. There, there's two ways to look at that, Chris. I think she's the luckiest woman in the world. Uh, <laughs> it's a little game we play. She's going to act like she's not. And uh, she's going to dread seeing me as much as she is, but it's just like, it's an act. It's not, uh, you know what I, I run a people. It's crazy to say it out loud, but I do run a very, a very busy environmental consulting company. I have not stopped running my company as president of RMA. Just to put into perspective, I work 240 days a year as president of RMA. That's how I have work balance issues is that I have that too as well. And, and on top of my business. So, uh, but you know what, I, 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 I've got a pretty good balance and I've got a pretty good lifestyle and I, uh, my office is on my farm and I've got horses and I can go ride ponies and I live in a nice big open space. So I have a pretty, pretty neat lifestyle. And actually um, I'm in, uh, in Egypt and Jordan in, in January. So uh, we're going to start traveling a little bit too. And um, I'm going to start doing some international work too as well. Uh, through my business. So yeah, I don't know. It'll be fun. It'll, it'll be a second honeymoon, Chris. <laughs> there you go. What's your message to municipal leaders as you depart? I know you're going to give your speech at the convention, but what's your message to Albertans today from a rural perspective and even your members who might be listening as they prepare to head off to uh, RMA and pass that vote to potentially the person who's going to succeed you? 
Well, I, you know, and I think probably the biggest message is be proud of what you do. And I just want to say thanks to, for what municipal leaders do. It's not easy. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, you're, you, you have to deal with uh, situations where it gets extremely complex and you may not always feel supported. And I just want to say thank you to all those folks. And, and you know, truly, th this is the best political job. I've been asked to be an MLA. I tell everybody this. I've been asked to be an MLA, MLA by every party, just to be clear. <laughs> every party has asked me, which is weird because then that probably tells you that nobody can tell what Party, I would just I actually... love to see you getting asked by the Liberal Party to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, do they still exist? Okay, I have. Oh, they do. <laughs> party. Um, and so, but but I think that this is the best job. I think political job in the province. And I've told MLAs that I've told ministers that I said you, you do know what the best political job is. President of RMA is like the best job. I work for the best people. It's like direct feedback. If I'm doing good, I hear it. If I'm doing bad, I hear that as well. Um, these are these are really amazing people, and I think that uh, we have to be proud of, of what we do, and and specifically to those the, the rural leaders. I think that you just need to make sure that your story, tell your story. We do amazing stuff as rural municipal leaders, and and I think that uh, um, great credit goes out to what you do. Uh, you need to be you need to make sure you're loud, and and it's okay to disagree, but no, don't be disagreeable. And and I think that uh, if we continue on the path we're on, we'll continue to be successful. So. My final question for you is the person who's going to be taking over for you from you is going to be, have to fill some pretty big shoes. And I've talked to all five candidates who are running to replace you and they all have acknowledged they have some pretty big shoes. And Cara Westerland even said, well, hopefully they're not high heel shoes, but if they are that I'm going to have to replace, then that's good. So what's your advice to them? What's the one piece of advice that you would give to your successor, whoever that may be? You know, I've seen the the leadership of from Jack Hayden, Don Johnson, Bob Bars, Al, Al Camry, and then to myself. And um, and each each successive person, it's always been the big shoes to fill. Um, but you know what? Every single time there's been a shift in leadership, um, you know, I wasn't Al, and Al wasn't Bob, and Bob wasn't Don. And and I think that uh, being genuine and true to yourself and being being authentic. I think is probably the most important thing. Um, you know, I, I wasn't El Carmi, amazing leadership. The guy was a, a, just a, just a gentleman leader, just a fantastic leader for our May. He did amazing work and, and my style is different. And I think that uh, just be authentic to yourself. I think it'll be incredible. So I love the fact, you know what, it, it's funny. People are like, Oh, what are you, what are you, are you worried about the election? I'm like, you know, five people want to do this job. I think that's amazing. I think that is a huge, huge message that this is a pretty neat opportunity and I'm so glad and I appreciate and thankful for all those people putting their names forward. Uh, I always tell people the hardest job in the world is, is, an, is to, or the hardest thing to try to win is a popularity contest because those, those hurt. I don't care who you are. If you lose a popularity contest, that, that is a test of your soul because those are hard ones. And so uh, I appreciate everybody putting their name up and, and I think that uh, whoever it is, uh, the people are wise and they will do an amazing job and they have a strong organization and, and I think they'll, uh, they'll just do great things for rural municipalities. And, uh, and I love the organization and definitely they will too as well. And uh, amazing things will happen. Paul, I want to truly thank you from the bottom of my heart because this is the last time I get to do this on the record, but thank you so much for sitting down with me over the last two years as the show has grown and being part of the growth of that municipal affairs and cross-border interviews has happened. So thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in person up at the convention next week. Thank you. And thank you for what you've done for municipalities, giving uh, folks a voice. I do appreciate that. And, hmm. and uh, I think we got great stories to tell. Pretty neat people. And I think you probably experienced that. Lots of character uh, and lots of interesting folks, right? So uh, thank you for what you've done too for the organizations. And thank you. You've been kind to RMA. Uh, you could have made my interview really horrible, but thank you. You could have grilled me really hard, Chris. Thank you so much for tuning in for a special Saturday edition of Municipal Affairs. Now we will be live in person at this year's RMA convention from November 5th to November 7th, covering this year's RMA presidency election. So we will have full coverage of that on Friday of next week. So you will not want to miss that. We also want to take a special moment and say thank you to Paul McLaughlin for sitting down with us over the last two years as we have evolved this show. And he has graciously taken his time and given us to us to discuss the issues that are important to rural municipalities in the province of Alberta. 
So we will be back later on this week with more coverage from the RMA convention. Until then, stay engaged, stay informed, and we'll see you next time on Municipal Affairs. Till then, everyone.